uh, this morning, uh, we're doing our Beyond our Sunday calendar. series, looking at what it means to follow Jesus in all of life, not just Sunday, but Monday to Saturday. And that, that includes our work life. So this morning, we're going to be talking about God at work. So we couldn't have planned that better with uh, the, the middle name Amelia, meaning work of God there. Now, uh, in case you're a guest and you're wondering how long is this guy going to be talking to you for, uh, we normally speak anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours. <laughs> but Tash said strictly no more than 30 minutes, otherwise she'll hit me on the other side of the face. So, so we're good, we're good. All right. Now, what I want to share with you this morning are some biblical principles, which if you grab a hold of them, will really help you to find more meaning, more freedom and more fulfilment in your work lives. So hands up if there's anyone here who wants to experience more meaning, more freedom and more fulfilment in your work lives. Anyone? You have come to the right place. But thankfully, it's the right place because God is here. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you care about every aspect of our lives. And Lord, this morning I pray, help each and every one of us to catch a hold of what you would wanna say to us about work. Paid work, unpaid work, but what you wanna have to say to us about work and our life with you at work. Everything that's of you, may we grab a hold of it. Everything that's not of you, may it just fall away and may it all be to your glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, according to research, fewer than 10% of churchgoers can remember that the last time their pastor preached on the topic of work. And yet, where do most people spend most of their waking hours? Someone said asleep. Let me, let me, just, let me just go through that one again. Where do most people spend most of their waking hours? At work, all right. Consider this, if someone went to church every Sunday for 40 years, they would accrue 2,000 hours in the pew. Over the same 40 years, they would accrue 100,000 hours in their workplace. In a famous lecture entitled, Why Work? Dorothy Sayers argued that in nothing has the church so lost hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the vocation of work. She has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing, she says, how can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine tenths of his life. Well, I'm here to tell you the good news is that God is interested in our work lives. It's not as if our church life is more spiritual than our work life. According to Christianity, all of life is sacred. To limit spirituality to when we're reading the Bible or going to church is to omit most of life from spiritual living, from the reality of God's presence and power. Phillips Brooks, the great American pastor, a teacher of a century ago, writes, to, pro to grow in one's spiritual life is not to be more religious where one is already religious, it is to be religious where he is irreligious now. Replace religious with spiritual. The Christian finds the hand of Christ in everything. God chose for us our work and means for us to find our spiritual education there. So that being said, it's really important that you hear the main point of the message this morning, which is this. Our work matters to God and God matters to our work. These are the two fundamental uh, biblical principles, which if you can really grab a hold of them, you will experience more freedom, more meaning and more fulfilment in your work. So can you repeat after me? My work matters to God. And God matters to my work. If you remember just those two points from this morning, then I will have done my work well this morning. So first point, my work 
matters to God. In the Greek myth of Sisyphus, poor Sisyphus is condemned by the gods to roll a rock up to the top of the mountain, only to have the rock roll back down to the bottom every time he reaches the top over and over and over again. It's a picture of unending, meaningless labour. And for a lot of people today, that's not far off their picture of work, that it's a necessary drudgery that we can't escape because we all need to put food on the table. According to a recent uh, YouGov poll, only 17% of Brits love their job and more than half of British workers describe themselves as being unhappy at work. And sadly, a lot of Christians feel negatively about work as well. And some even have a sort of myth of Sisyphus theology about work, looking at it as a consequence of the fall of humanity, believing that prior to the fall, Adam and Eve lived in paradise, but then they sinned and part of the punishment was that they had to start working in order to eat. But if we go back to the book of Genesis, we'll see that's not the biblical work view of work at all. In Genesis chapter two, which surprisingly occurs before Genesis chapter three, we read these words. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to rest on a lounge chair and drink pina coladas all day. Is that what it says? The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it. And, and keep it. So we see that work's actually something that you and I were created for. It didn't come as a curse of the fall. It was there before the fall. Dorothy Sayers writes, work should be looked upon at, not as a necessary drudgery to be undergone for the purpose of making money, but as a way of life in which the nature of man should find its proper exercise and delight and so fulfill itself to the glory of God. Whose idea was work? God's idea. Who himself is a worker? God. God both created and ordered the world and did it in such a way to give us a familiar pattern of a working week. Six days of activity followed by a day of rest. And on the sixth day, we are told, God reached the pinnacle of his creative activity by making us men and women in his own image, which is hugely empowering, especially when you consider or compare that with the creation stories in other cultures around Israel at the time, people were not called image of God, they were called slaves of God. The only people who were called image of God was the king and royalty. In Genesis, however, all human beings are created in the image of God, even babies which is generally how most of us got to be here. Giving men and women a status not found in other worldviews. All of us bear the image of God. And one of the ways in which we image or represent God on earth is by carrying out what is sometimes called by theologians the creation mandate. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, to be fruitful and multiply and gently subdue and have dominion over the earth. Now, this is really important. This is not about conquering. This is about cultivating. The words subdue and have dominion get lost in translation. But what it means is we are to contribute as sub-creators to God's creative project on earth. You and I are given a responsibility to care and to cultivate and to craft God's world on His behalf and in relationship with Him. And this means the building of families, the growing of crops, the breeding of animals, the tending of the garden, and by extension, the development of culture and civilization, building houses, designing clothes, writing poetry, teaching students, maintaining justice, healing patients, producing furniture. In other words, when we as human beings go to work, when we are making clothes, or building software, or machinery, or practicing law, or tilling fields, or mending broken bodies, or nurturing children, we are answering God's call to steward and cultivate His world as His representatives, His image. 
So you see, we must not devalue our work because it is intrinsically good. It came before the fall. Far from being a curse of the fall, it is actually a gift of God. The painting by Thomas uh, uh, Hart Benton entitled Cradling Wheat captures something of work's dignity and significance, reminding us that it's in the ordinary rhythms of daily life and work that we are fulfilled. As moment by moment, we fulfill the call to cultivate goodness on a little patch of God's soil for His glory and for the blessing of the world. And do you know what else the Bible says? It says, we don't stop working when we die. The afterlife is not gonna be a place where we all just sit around and look at each other and look at God doing nothing. There will be meaningful and fulfilling work to do. In Revelation 2.26, Jesus says, the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. As Christians, we are destined to reign with Jesus Christ in the endlessly ongoing creative work of God and governance of the universe. And the Bible says it's our faithfulness over the few things in this present phase of life that develops the kind of character that can be entrusted with the many things in the phase of life to come. Now, what these many things look like or will look like, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has yet conceived, as the Bible says, but perhaps the poet and the writer George MacDonald catches something of a glimpse of it when he writes, And in the perfect time, O perfect God, when we are in our home, our native, our natal home, when joy shall carry every sacred load, and from its life and peace no heart shall roam, what if thou make us able to make like thee, to light with moons, to clothe with greenery, to hang gold, O sunsets, sorry, to hang gold sunsets over a rose and purple sea? So you see, our work as human beings is hugely significant and meaningful and will continue to be hugely and significant and meaningful for eternity. Our work matters to God because God too is a worker. And when we work, we image our creator. So that's the first point. Point number one, our work matters to God. Point number two, and God matters to our work. God matters to my work. We've seen that work's not a curse, but a gift. Not something intrinsically evil, but something intrinsically good. Something we were built for. Something our loving creator intended for our blessing and for the blessing of his creation. But here's a question you may be wondering. If work is such a gift, why does it often feel like such a curse? Why do we so often feel frustrated in our jobs or unfulfilled in our careers? What's going on? Well, this comes back to something that we touched on earlier. The Bible says that the way that things are in the world now is not the way that it should be. Not everything is the way that it should be. Something's broken and it's because of sin. We can read about it in Genesis chapter three that when humanity sinned, when they stopped trusting and listening to God, that pain and suffering entered into the world. And so we read in Genesis 3, after humanity sinned, that cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And so our experiences of work now involves pain as well as pleasure. But again, even though work now can be painful and tiresome and frustrating, it is not itself the curse. It is still intrinsically valuable. And so our approach to work should not be to resent it, but to redeem it. As Dallas Willard puts it, work is not the curse of humanity's fall into sin. It's sweat from self-reliance. That's the curse. So let's not resent work. Let's redeem it. And how do we do that? Well, we do that not only by seeing that our work matters to God, but also that God matters to my work. We need to learn to embrace God at work. 
My friend Os Guinness is a well-known uh, Christian writer who in his book, The Call, talks about the importance of learning to live our lives before one audience that trumps the all others, the audience of one, the audience of God. He writes, I live before the audience of one. Before others, I have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, nothing to lose. As Paul writes in Colossians chapter three, in whatever we do, we work at it with all our heart as working unto the Lord rather than human beings. This principle of living for the audience of one in our workplace can bring renewed meaning, freedom, and fulfillment into our work lives in multiple ways. For example, one of the biggest problems in the workplace today is anxiety. And often at the root of anxiety is the search for significance and success that hinges on the recognition or approval of others. Most of us, whether we are aware of it or not, are living for the approval of some audience or other. And so we end up anxiously concerning ourselves with outward symbols of perceived success, worrying about whether we measure up or not, whether we are a success or not, whether we are significant in others' eyes or not. But living for the audience of one can rescue us from trying to find our significance and identity in whether other people think we are a success. This can be particularly freeing if we work for overly demanding or unreasonable bosses or colleagues to know that ultimately we're not working to please their impossible expectations, but rather to please the Lord. It works the other way as well. If on the other hand, we work in, in an environment where people are prone to laziness, only working hard when the boss is looking, our faith also directs us to be different, to work wholeheartedly, as it says in Ephesians chapter six, whether our bosses are noticing or not, as if we were serving the Lord, not people, because we know that it is the Lord who ultimately rewards us. Thus, by living for the audience of one, we are more likely to avoid the equal and opposite extremes of irresponsibility and laziness on the one hand, and anxiety and burnout on the other. Plus, in learning to live for the audience of one, we discover we don't have to try to get those jobs or, or those careers or those roles uh, that only this world values, usually those that command more money or power. Rather, we can begin to think of our careers much more so in terms of service or vocation, aligning what we do with a sense of purpose in who God has made us to be and the gifts that he's given us. The author Frederick Buechner helpfully defines our vocation like this. He says, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. To the greatest extent possible, Christians should seek to work in that place where one's gifts and passions intersect with God's priorities and the world's needs. Christian author Amy Sherman calls this our vocational sweet spot. Finding that sweet spot, she says, is a journey. It takes time. And we might not get there straight away or we might not get there perfectly. And there are certain seasons of life that make that more challenging than others. But nonetheless, to the extent that it is possible, that is the goal to which we ought to aim our lives, to, to work in that place where one's gifts and passions intersect with God's priorities and the world's needs, rather than some arbitrary goal fashioned on what we think will make us look successful in other people's eyes. And yet, even as we seek to follow our callings and, and vocation, we must also always remember the even more fundamental principle that even prior to being called to do something for God, whether it's politics or teaching or parenting, we are called to someone. 
Our primary calling is always to God. Our secondary calling are the things that we do in our lives for God, and they can vary in different seasons of life. As Os Guinness writes, we can therefore say as a matter of secondary calling that we're called to homemaking or the practice of law or to art history, but these are callings rather than the calling. They are our personal answer to God's address, to His summons. Secondary callings matter but only because the primary calling following Christ matters most. But sometimes people struggle to see their jobs through the lens of calling or vocation, especially I've discovered in the business world. For example, Dallas Willard observes that if you were to ask people, what is the business of business? Isn't that a good question? What is the business of business? The spontaneous response among most business people today is what? Make money. The business of business is to make money for those who are engaged in it. Willard says the answer seems so obvious to anyone in business that hardly anybody would question it. But actually, he says, the idea that the primary purpose of business is to make money for those who are engaged in it is a quite recent view of business, historically speaking. He says the older tradition of the business profession is, like other professions, the business profession has an important moral role to play in society. So that thinker, great thinker John Ruskin, for example, living in the 19th century, wrote that the role of the five great intellectual professions necessary to the life of every civilised nation was as follows. With respect to that nation, the soldier's profession is to defend it, the pastors to teach it, the physicians to keep it in health, the lawyers to enforce justice in it, the merchants, the business persons, to provide for it. Thus, the essential function of every profession is, in their own unique way, to bless, to give something to the community rather than to pluck or to plunder from the community. As Ruskin observes, it is no more the business person's, no more the merchant's function to get profit for himself than it is the pastor's function to get his stipend. The stipend is a due and necessary adjunct, but not the object of his life. If he be a true clergyman, any more than his fee is the object of life to a true physician, neither is his fee the object of life to a true merchant, or three, if true men have a work to be done. Do you see what he's saying? The the primary aim of the business person is not to make money any more than the primary aim of the doctor or the teacher or the pastor is to make money. And deep down, we all know this, which is why no business has as its public mission statement, we exist to make money. And why no professionals tell their clients that the main reason that they are in their profession is for the money. Of course, one must get paid if one is to serve, but the nuance, the challenge is we live in a world where you can make money without really helping anyone. For example, you can flip a house by painting over the cracks or you can flip a business by buying it, uh, getting rid of half the employees and then selling it on before the inevitable problems that arise from not having enough staff surface to the top. Or you can sell products to people that they don't really need. Or you can make terrific products and services for your clients and yet treat your employees with terrible working conditions. John Ruskin writes, It is the responsibility of businesses not only to be thinking about how to make money, but how to make what we do most beneficial to people's lives. Now, this is a high calling, not just for business owners, but for all of us who have responsibility in our places of work for other people. All of us who have the privilege of having an influence in our places of work should be asking ourselves this this question. How can what we do as an organisation be done in such a way that it brings good to others? How can what we do in an organisation be done in such a way that it brings good to others? And encouragingly, there are lots of great examples of people whose faith has inspired them to make a difference in their work contexts. For example, the former CEO of Hallmark Cards, Irv Hockaday, 
one day asked himself how his faith might shape decisions about the product offerings at Hallmark Cards. And as he prayed about it, he decided that Hallmark would make greeting cards for people who had loved ones who were dying. He says, these were for people who were in the hospice. We realised there was no profit to be made on this. We couldn't sell enough of these cards to make a profit, but we felt like it was the right thing to do to help people be able to care for their loved ones during times like this. They were able to make it work and so bless people. Uh, Arthur Guinness, who grew up in the 18th century at a time when gin houses were becoming so ubiquitous that every sixth house in England was a gin house. So all throughout England and Ireland, and so you can imagine there was lots of drunkenness and lots of crime and poverty and broken families. And Arthur Guinness, moved by the plight of broken homes and broken families, prayed to God for inspiration and help to do something about the rampant alcoholism on the streets of Ireland. In fact, he felt God calling him to make a drink that men will drink that will be good for them. And so he ended up, (laughs) true story. And so he ended up developing a stout beer called Guinness. Praise God for divine inspiration. Especially Guinness cold, yeah. And so, yeah, and the Guinness contains so much iron that people felt full before they could drink more pints. Hence, Guinness Brewery was born. Now, similarly, Cabri Chocolate was founded by a Quaker, John Cabri, who also concerned with the damaging effects of alcoholism on families and societies, started selling drinking chocolate as an alternative beverage to alcohol. This was before the age of awareness of dental hygiene and how quickly chocolate gets rid of your teeth. But anyway, um, and it did really, really well and it helped. And his sons, when they took over the now successful business, also were influenced by their Christian faith. And they tried to think of other ways of improving people's lives. At a time when factory working conditions were dangerous and workers' living conditions deplorable, the Cabris made sure that their factories were safe and humane. They provided their employees with good wages, medical treatment, educational opportunities and pension plans. And they bought up land around their factory to build a community for their workers named Bourneville Village They wanted to provide a safe, pleasant place to live. George Cadbury said of his plans, quote, If each man could have his own house, a large garden to cultivate and healthy surroundings, then I thought there will be for them a better opportunity of a happy family life. The brothers set new standards for working and living conditions in Victoria and Britain and the Cadbury plant in Bourneville became known as, does anyone know? The factory in a garden. These are just, there's tons of these wonderful examples, but these are just some of the many examples of church opening themselves up to God at work, not just on Sundays, but in all their lives, including their Mondays to Fridays. Followers of Jesus being salt and light in the world with God's help, praying for and taking responsibility for influencing the workplaces and institutions in which they work for the common good. As James Hunter argues in his book, To Change the World, the church as it exists within the wide range of individual vocations in every sphere of social life, commerce, philanthropy, education, must be present in the world in ways that work towards the constructive subversion of all frameworks of life that are incompatible with the shalom, God's comprehensive peace and right relationships for which we were made and to which we are called. As a natural expression of its passion to honour God in all things and to love our neighbour as ourselves, the church and its people will challenge all structures that dishonour God, dehumanise people and neglect or do harm to the creation. And you thought church was just for Sundays. Church is the hope of the world. And finally, another way in which we can be salt and light in the workplace is by building relationships with people at work and sharing Jesus. Living for the audience of one includes seeing our workplaces as contexts where God's placed us as salt and light by how we live 
our character and by what we say to our colleagues about the gospel when we get the opportunity. The fact that we work alongside them gives us an opportunity that others do not have and God expects us to use it for His kingdom purposes. Now, just to clarify, that doesn't mean sending an email to all our work colleagues every morning with a Bible verse or preaching over the factory intercom system. That would probably be highly counterproductive and off-putting. But what I mean is just being true to your authentic self, not hiding who you really are when you go to work. I was chatting with William Bevington uh, earlier this week and he made the terrific point that even though less and less people go to church today, nonetheless, the modern workplace in his experience, is actually incredibly open to the Christian faith simply because it is, credi- is, it is incredibly open to every faith and embracing of every belief because it has to be because of equality and diversity policies in the workplace. These policies mean that the workplace is meant to be a place, theoretically, where every person can bring their whole selves into the workplace including Christians. I myself have had the incredible opportunity to speak about the Christian faith in schools and law firms and banks and accountancy firms and government uh, and other workplaces because the Christian group in those workplaces established under the equality and diversity policy in those workplaces invited me to do that. And my experience has been that people who come along to listen, people of all faiths and none have been overwhelmingly positive and appreciative in their response. Why? Because generally speaking, people are looking for answers. People are looking for hope. People are looking for meaning and freedom and fulfilment, which is exactly what you and I have to offer, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. So be yourself in your workplace and don't be afraid to talk about your faith with other people. Remember, God is at work at work. God is at work at work. And who knows? Maybe you could think about starting a Christian group in your organisation if you don't have one already. They are a wonderful way to remain encouraged and accountable as well as a powerful way to share the good news through colleagues, through outreach. And I'm sure she won't um, mind me saying, but if you want to know how to do that as part of your company's equality and diversity policy, how to start a Christian workplace group, then have a chat to Liz Patterson in our church who helps head up a Christian workplace group in her work context. So in closing, can I invite you all to consider, are you living for the audience of one in your work context? Do you really believe that your work matters to God and that God matters to your work? Until you do, you won't experience all of the meaning and freedom and fulfilment that God intends to work to bring into your life at work. But the more that we press into this, the more that we learn to live for the audience of one in our workplaces, the more we will experience the meaning and the freedom and the fulfilment that comes from working ultimately for who? For God. And here's the good news, not just for God, but with God. Co-creating with the Creator and cultivating goodness in the world, not just for this life, but for all eternity. As Leslie Newbigin puts it, every faithful active service, every honest labour to make the world a better place, which seem to have been forgotten, are forever lost and forgotten in the rubble of history, will be seen on that day at the final resurrection to have contributed to the perfect fellowship of God's kingdom. All who committed their work in faithfulness to God will be by Him raised up to share in the new age and will find that their labour was not lost, but that it has found its place in the completed kingdom. And so we can say together with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labour is not in vain. Let's pray. Can I invite Tash to come up and to pray for us. Wonderful. Why don't we just stand for a moment?
And um, I just want you to just close your eyes and we're just going to give you a moment of stillness just to invite the Holy Spirit to really speak to you. And I just want to encourage you to just ask the Lord, how does my work matter to you, God? When I get up tomorrow and in my day tomorrow, what matters to you? And just ask the Lord to speak to you about that, to show you what is it that matters to him. And then just, I want you to just speak to him and say to him, God, you matter to my work because, and it could be because without you, I can't do anything. It could be because I need your insight, I need your wisdom, but just pray to him and say, God, you matter to my work because. I just want to pray for all of us, actually. So would you put your hands out and just in, in response to God, I, I, want, I feel a sense to just pray that the Lord would just um, unlock entrepreneurial uh, capacities in us as a, as a church, as Venture Church. Because I see, um, I see God working His kingdom through His people here. And I believe that for some of you, God's given you an idea of something. And, and so I just really, uh, if that's you, I just pray for you that you would have the courage to, um, to be God's person and to take hold of that idea. And it might be something really random or ridiculous, but to actually keep, keep it before the Lord and keep running after it. That, that this community might be a community of people involved in their workplace, setting up new businesses, um, that has this purpose to serve the greater good, to alleviate poverty, to grant dignity to people, to, um, Lord, to, to look after this world that You've given to us as a gift, that we would be a community of people that are creative and insightful, Lord, that we're bold and courageous in a world that, that values the prophet above everything else, that we would be a people that values others and seeks to serve our great God and to help others around us. And so, Lord, I pray for new kingdom initiatives through your people. I pray that you would unlock resources and enable those initiatives to get off the ground, Lord. I pray for inspiration. I pray for teams of people to come together and to work towards bringing goodness and beauty and truth to bear in this world, Lord. And so I pray that for each and every one of us. But I do ask, Lord Jesus, that we always come back to you and know that it is not in our own strength, but it's because of Jesus Christ who lives in us that we do anything fruitful and abundant in this world. And so I pray this, Lord, in your name.